about killing off the bacteria that perhaps we believe threaten our patients, but is it possible that actually the most of the bacteria that live within our bodies are a hundred trillion friends we didn't know we had? And rather than trying to kill them off, perhaps someday we'll be giving them back. Perhaps someday we'll be reading books about how we'll actually use our poop and our bacteria to write prescriptions to improve the care of our patients rather than antibiotics to kill off the bacteria that live in our patients' bodies. Well, that may not be surprising because I think it's key to remember that our world is largely a microbial world. Multicellular organisms like we humans are very rare, whereas much of the diversity on Earth exists in our bacteria. Why should you care about your microbiome? Why should you care about your microbes so much? Well, have you ever wondered why it is when you go into the woods and you get bit by a mosquito and your wife or husband does not? Why does that occur? Well, it's the microbiome that live on your skin. It's not just that you're sweeter. Or perhaps they may play a bigger role in our lives. They may even guide the microbiome that lives in our gut. They may even guide who we have sex with or mates with, ultimately. If you're a fruit fly. Perhaps we'll show this is true in humans as well, we just haven't gotten that far yet. How do they do all that? How do they do all these things? Well, what is it that makes us human? Perhaps you think it's our cells that make us human. Well, there's 30 trillion human cells in our body at any given time, and 38 trillion microbial cells. Well, cellularly, we're largely bacterial. Perhaps you think it's our genes that make us human, our genetics. 20,000 human genes, 20 million microbial genes. So we're about 1% genetically human and 99% bacterial. We are finally able to begin to answer big questions about our microbes and ourselves because we can finally identify them. Using 16S microbiome technology recently, the Human Microbiome Project spent $173 million characterizing the bacterial makeup of 250 healthy people. And they took the terabytes of this data and they mapped them out. So I think it's first key to realize that different parts of your body look very differently. The microbes that live in your stool are very different, luckily perhaps, than the microbes that live in your mouth. At least it's supposed to be that way. And when we map them out, we get a map like this. And although each microbe looks the same under the microscope, when we map them out in different body parts, they map out much like continents on a map with the mouth, the skin, and other places looking very different, perhaps, than the stool, like continents on a map. Where do our microbes come from? Well, they come from birth, of course. Until recently, all of us were born by vaginal delivery. And thus, for the first two years of life, we've all reflected, in our stool and everywhere else, our mother's vaginal secretions. But now, with the advent of C-sections, babies born by C-section will resemble the mom's skin for the first two years. We know that children born by C-section have more asthma, allergy, and obesity. In fact, my collaborator, Rob Knights, who helped do the human microbiome project, when his child was born, kicked everyone out of the room after the C-section and smeared the vaginal secretions of the mom all over the baby. I recommend all of you do the same. It's about the only thing you remember from this talk, but nonetheless, it's key. So what's in our patient's guts in the ICU? Can it help or hurt them? Clearly, many of the things we do in the ICU, including vasopressors, we've heard of the difference they may make in our outcomes, and clearly our antibiotics do disastrous things to our bacterial microbes. They blight the lawn of what happens to our patient's normal makeup. Perhaps we should be restarting that lawn. I can tell you, perhaps we should use poop pills. The students at MIT at the university in the US will sell you their poop pills. And they'll make you smarter, perhaps. You can buy them and take them. We do have some data in the probiotic world in the ICU. This is data we recently published. So I think giving back probiotics may help reduce infection, may help reduce some of the complications we suffer. And we know that stool transplants are very successful at curing C. diff. What happens to the microbiome of the patient with C. diff? This is a look at the microbiome Looking at the human gut, human microbiome project is our baseline. If we put the patient with C. diff in this particular study into that, 
you can see their stool, these are stool samples, look very different. And in fact, when we give a stool donor down at the bottom to the patients, their fecal microbiome immediately returns to normal and stays there, which is why it's so successful and so stable in here in these patients. Again, an incredible effect. It can restore balance, and so perhaps where do we go from here? Large clinical trials of probiotics in the ICU, stool transplants for all our patients, poop pills for all our patients from MIT. Even the TV doctors in America know that's not how it works any longer. John Louis said it well, and you're hearing it again today. One size doesn't fit everybody. The NIH didn't buy our trial, ended up cutting myself and Derek Heiler, one of the large trial to study probiotics. And the NIH said this, define the microbiome first. Tell us what's missing. Tell us what should be in the poop pills, what should be in the probiotics, and come back to us with personalized medicine trials. So we did that. We did the ICU microbiome project, collecting samples in the ICU, realizing perhaps we could learn how to use this microbiome map barcode to predict mortality, to predict infection risk, to predict our use of antibiotics and what bacteria perhaps someday we need to give back to our patients rather than taking them away. So our first publication last fall looked at 115 patients across four centers in the U.S. mechanically ventilated longer than 40 hours. I will tell you 100% of these patients got antibiotics. I was a bit shocked by that, although I guess that's the reality of our treatment of bacteria in this world in the ICU. We compared these against the American Gut Project, 1,200 patients out of a group of 6,000 that Rob Knight's group has gotten by getting people to send their stool, their wife's stool, their dog's stool, and other people's stool, and paying him to analyze it. We had 1,200 controls. This is the American Human Microbiome Project here. Cost $173 million. Rob Knight has analyzed 6,000 patients and made $2 million. He's the largest crowdfunded scientist in history by getting people to send their poop, their stool. It's pretty amazing you can send it to you. Our hypothesis in the ICU was this. A healthy gut is a diverse gut. And loss of diversity will be associated with poor outcome. Our most significant results I'll present to you. What we saw was critical as leads to a clear shift to proteobacteria, the pathogens, from normal healthy gut flora. And this is the three-dimensional curve, much like you saw before. The red patients are the healthy patients. The blue patients are a large shift away from normal in the fecal samples of the IC patient. More disturbingly, remember I told you there is great separation normally between fecal and oral and skin. We lose that separation in the ICU there in the big dots, as you can see, as our mouth and our stool begin to look the same in the ICU. Very troubling, perhaps, as we lose barrier function and our bacteria lose diversity. This is that same plot showing now that we're losing significant amounts of healthy bacteria. The Firmicutes are very important healthy species in our gut. The large dots in white showing a lack of abundance of those organisms that are normally quite abundant in our guts. And then you see the large growth in proteobacteria, the orange or the red on the screen there, an incredible increase in the pathogens that normally are not present in our gut, that predominate in the setting. So this marked increase in pathogenic bacteria appearance. Some specific depletions that we found in the ICU patients. The Calibacterium prosnuxii, it makes short chain fatty acids, been shown to be anti-inflammatory and inflammatory bowel disease, massively depleted. A vital bug in our gut, a vital bacteria in our gut, not present in most of the ICU patients. And large overgrowth of staph and proteus and other gram negatives, as you might imagine, would occur in these patients. In the mouth, again, normal flora being depleted, and staph and mycoplasma overtaking the normal oral pharynx. It's a graph of the different changes in bacterial species going up on the bars over here in the ICU, and being depleted in ICU patients. You see the firmicutes most dramatically depleted on the right. Diversity is lost as well. You can see the more diverse you are, the further your curves fall up and to the right. The less diverse you are in the ICU patient's case, the farther to the left and down. We lose a lot of diversity. In fact, we saw a very crash in diversity with as much as 95% of the human fecal stream being made up of one organism, where normally it's 20 to 30% of single organism most abundant. You can see in this patient, 
25% of the stool is made up of one organism, but a few days later, just a few days later, 95% being made up of one organism, uh, Massinidobacter, or adding in our pockets. So there's a crash in diversity. What our bacteria in our guts look like changes dramatically as well. Normally, fecal streams should look like the red bars there. That's what it should appear to be, but it actually begins to resemble a child's gut. The purple are pediatric gut samples taken from very small infants. Global gut program, you can see in purple there, predominating. And the mouth begins to look like the skin. The green there is what a normal skin floor should look like. The mouth becomes the skin as we become critically ill. Unfortunately, many of the samples begin to turn orange as well. That's skin <coughs> taken from autopsy crime scenes. Dying bodies, dead bodies. Pathogenic bacteria from corpses appearing in orange there. And just this week, we began to do the fecal metabolome. What is the fecal metabolome? It's looking at the metabolomics of what's in our stool. We extract that, and as you can see, there's significant differences in the metabolome, the compounds, the drugs, the metabolites that live in our gut and in our stool when we're critically ill. They're blue versus red. And this seems to correlate with Apache score. You can see Apache score correlation with the metabolome across multiple sites. The higher the Apache score, the more distinct the metabolome of the gut. And that was true of the nutrition-based nutrient score as well. Seems to be big differences in the metabolites we can make in the gut. One final piece here. We did molecular networking on the fecal stream of these patients. You can see compounds identified that we know what they are in red, and then the blue things again identifying that are associated with each other. And so clearly we can look at some things like drugs. We can see drugs appear in your fecal stream and your metabolome. We can see antibiotics appear, beta blockers appear, but we found one very novel thing appearing. The Pseudomonas quinolone signal. This is a made by a Pseudomonas antibacterial virulence factor that actually kills off the bacteria around it, inhibits their protective effects, and allows Pseudomonas or other gram natives to take over. This has never been described in the stool of a human that we can find in the literature. It's only been shown in one or two studies in the secretions of CF adults. It seems to be a virulence factor for the bacteria in our gut. We correlated that to the infection rate in these patients, and we found patients with this signal, 10% of them had it, had a much higher rate of infection, bacteremia, culture-proven C. diff colitis. The combination of the two was quite dramatic. This may be a single signal we can test with virulence, the quorum sensing of our bacteria, that we've never seen published in the literature in a human, actually ever. We only found this last week. So to summarize these results, we found some associations of ICU death with Klebsiella appearance on the skin and some other bacteria as well. Bacteremia seemed to associate with oral mycoplasma overgrowth. Patients becoming my bacteremic. ARDS also was some specific organisms appearing in our stool or in our mouth. Role of antibiotics. The question the reviewers gave us was, is it the, the critical illness causing the problem or is it the antibiotics causing the problem? So we created an antibiotic pressure score using a published Lancet score, using antibiotic pressure. And we found that the oral samples do appear to associate with the pressure of antibiotics that they organize around how much antibiotic you've got. The fecal effects don't seem to do that. So there's something unique about what we do to patients in the critical care setting beyond antibiotics that change how our fecal microbiome appears. So it's more this dysbiosis, this change. It's more than just antibiotics. Diversity played its role as well. The longer staying patients in green had less diversity. The shorter staying patients in blue, the median was 22 days length of stay, had more diversity as you might imagine. And as for the targets, we have specific targets now. We can go back to the NIH with to say what well, we should treat, the bacterium being one of them. So again, the magnitude of change in diversity seemed to associate with mortality. We still have a great deal of data left to analyze. We would love for any of you who have questions. We have data that can go on for years from this project. If you have questions you'd like to address, we'd love to have you join us and address them. So to close, what have we learned so far? Change in specific organisms is associated with changes in clinical outcome. And a healthy gut is a diverse gut. And IC does lead to a significant loss of diversity in the gut microbiome, and that associates with a poor outcome. So perhaps we can correct this. Perhaps we can change the world the microbial world that we live in by giving back
stool transplants, strapped poop pills, perhaps probiotics, to resod the lawn of our patients and give our patients back the hundred trillion friends they need and restore balance to their gut and do it in such a way it's so simple, even the child can do it. <coughs> you want to go online, you too can send your stool to Rob Knight. This is Daniel, who did all the analysis for this study. He's a computer scientist, and they will be happy to analyze your stool as well. We bring children into the lab to show them how robots analyze poop all day. Not all the kids are thrilled to see it, but I hope you are. With that, I'll thank Rob Knight, some sampling Komodo dragon at our zoo, and I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you.